Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, today's conversation, we have Stephen Burks with us today, 45 minutes long, followed by Q&A. There you go. Stephen is forwarding <laughs> to us. Um, we're going to record this for uh, archive purpose, and we'll also post it on Vimeo so that everyone can watch it later on if you want. And we're also muting everyone to ensure audio clarity. And now let's turn to Glenn Atkinson. Thank you very much, Lucy. Hey there, Stephen. Good morning to you. Hey, Glenn. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. First of all, if you have questions for Stephen during our conversation, just put them in the chat box and Lucy will pick them up and we will discuss them at the end, last 15 minutes of the conversation. And also, if you'd like to let us know where you're tuning in from, that's really fun for us to see. So go ahead and put that in the chat box as well. Just give us a shout out. Uh, Stephen, you are coming to us from Brooklyn, I imagine. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> here I am in my little home studio. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a, later in the conversation, but you are finding ways to be creative and still work at home during this lockdown. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's funny. This 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 we're sheltering in place, let's say, right? So um, we've been thinking a lot about what that means, right? To to kind of shelter, uh, and and that's a funny word. It's an interesting word to use. Um, it speaks to this kind of like almost uh, primary means of of finding uh, a habitation, right? Um, but then it also makes you think about all of those people who haven't really been conscious at home. You know what I mean? Who just kind of like been floating through, who, who work insane hours and spend very little time um, in their kind of domestic space. And so now they're kind of confronted, uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> with, uh, with their homes. And so I think it's, it's interesting that they, um, the, the government term is shelter rather than home. Uh, and, and it speaks a lot to the, the, the way they look at it versus the way we can all look at it. So we've been spending time um, here at home kind of getting to know each other and <laughs> getting to know our space. And, and, uh, and I think, um, you know, like most creative people, making things and trying to improve things. Hmm. I like the idea of being confronted with your own home or your own domestic environment. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really great way of understanding the positive and obviously negative qualities of what everybody is going through now. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start uh, showing images because we have a lot to look at, which is sure. fantastic. Um, and what we're going to do today is a little different in that we're going to just have this uh, keynote presentation running as Stephen and I talk. So we won't be speaking directly to the images, although some things will come up that we'll certainly mention. Um, the way I thought we might start the conversation though, Stephen, is to just ask a little bit about how you got into being a designer in the first place. Uh, so just tell us a little bit of your story, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, maybe I'll just uh, mention the fact that what everyone's seeing on the screen is, is what I think of as kind of like a stream of consciousness. Uh, <laughs> this is not just um, a kind of portfolio body of work, but um, images from my travels, uh, images from things that have inspired us along the way, uh, work in progress, process, um, you know, everything from, uh, I, I guess, a little more than 10 years ago, um, when the studio formally became Steven Burke's Man Made. Um, we were called Ready Made Projects uh, before then. And that was um, a really different time. There was, <clears throat> there was a big shift in, in our practice around 2010 uh, mm -hmm. when we had the Studio Museum show. Um, so this stream of consciousness series of images is is my way of like letting people into uh, my world, let's say. So what it's like being in your brain? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because I don't I don't really distinguish between all the things that you know we were working on. Um, I think that uh, like we mentioned before, um, fashion, uh, architecture, uh, design, graphics, um, the art world, all of these things, music are happening simultaneously, you know, around the world. So design shouldn't, I mean, in my opinion, be separated from uh, a kind of collective cultural consciousness. Mm. So uh, I kind of got into design through um, art, really. So tell us about that, so, because it's, um, I think it's unusual 
uh, in some ways to set out to be a designer as a young person, uh, particularly okay. a person of color in America, which we'll again talk about. But can you just tell us something of your trajectory into the field and why it made sense to you to call yourself a designer rather than let's say an artist or an architect? Yeah, I mean, I grew up um, on the south side of Chicago in a, in a pretty challenging neighborhood, <laughs> I can say. <laughs> um, and no one in my family was creative. Uh, so what we did have at a very early age were um, memberships to the Art Institute of Chicago. So um, big up to the Art Institute for <laughs> making me the man that I am. Um, so at a very young age, I guess from nine years old on, I was going on my own to look at art and, and wondering what that whole thing was about. Um, in my neighborhood, the only place that I was finding a kind of consistent aesthetic image was... Uh, the Catholic Church, you know, so I went to Catholic school and uh, when I was in church, I would look around and, and understand that there is a connection between the objects that we hold, um, the things that we're sitting on and the building that surrounds us. Mm. And so that was always the world that I wanted to be in, not the Catholic Church, but, <laughs> but, but the, the built environment, let's call it, right? So, and do, you, um, do you think that that also imbued you with a sense that objects and architecture should have some kind of ritual or could have some kind of ritual value? Is that um, part of what that religious space gave you? You know, it was more about uh, a sense of scale. Um, the, the, I've, I've often talked about the, our practices about the scale of the hand, the scale of the body, the scale of the interior. Um, and so we try and touch upon all of those things. Um, and, and for me, those are the scales of, of the human body right? Like how we engage with the things inside of architecture um, are what, uh, what's most interesting to us. So, mm -hmm. and, and that, I think that engagement uh, also led me to believe that everyone is capable of design. Mm. So that brings us to the question, I guess, of professionalism and how you actually entered the field properly. Right. Um, so yeah, just historically speaking, uh, I went to grad school for architecture at Columbia here in New York um, after studying at the Institute of Design in Chicago. Um, I studied at the new Bauhaus because it was really, you know, growing up in Chicago, you're surrounded by all of these incredible buildings. And, and my mom worked, actually worked in a Harry Weiss building. Um, Harry Weiss obviously was a disciple of Mies van der Rohe. And so um, I only applied to one school undergrad because I wanted to study in Crown Hall which, <laughs> you know, if you haven't been, it's, it's a lot like a church somehow, you know, it's a very spiritual place. And that, uh, those classical proportions, the way the light travels over the building, these kinds of things really led me to, um, to wanting to go on to study architecture. Uh, and then I went to Columbia and, and that kind of changed my mind. <laughs> when you were, uh, before we leave Chicago behind, when you were at uh, the Institute of Design, as it came to be called, but was founded by Laszlo Mahali Naj um, right. before the war uh, as the new Bauhaus. Was that Bauhaus legacy still intact there? Like, did you feel like... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, had, we had courses that were directly carried over from the Bauhaus. I mean, mm -hmm. visual training, um, learning to place two lines on a board, two perpendicular lines on a board of, of varying thickness. Uh, um, we had uh, graphic design, we had architectural photography, um, all of these things coming directly from uh, the Bauhaus. Mm. Okay, so then Columbia was a shift for you in some perspectival way? Yeah, I mean, you know, we learned at ID and at IIT that architecture was the art and science of building, right? Um, and uh, uh, it was, I had Alfred Caldwell, uh, who was really, <laughs> amazing old uh, instructor. I think one of the last who have worked with Mies directly. And uh, he used to say that architecture is the uh, art and science of keeping water out of a building. Mm. So <laughs> imagine arriving at a place like Columbia with this, uh, this very international cosmopolitan um, history theory program and, and coming from a place of, of functional uh, sort of building and you know, coming head to head with theory, right? So it, I, I, for me, it, would, it opened my eyes quite a bit, but it also reminded me that I was more interested in design than architecture. Right, okay. And it maybe confirmed in you that you did want to have, I don't know if I want to use the word commercial, but you wanted to have a kind of practical orientation and make 
functional objects that people might actually have in their shelters. Yeah, I, I didn't really think about anything commercial, um, which is odd because I didn't have very much money and <laughs> surviving <laughs> in New York. <laughs> and, and actually, I mean, I guess if you look at my work, I'm still not the most commercial designer. Um, but I, for me, the ideas were always most important, you know? I felt like, you know, to have the opportunity to participate first and foremost was, was uh, you know, relevant and, <clears throat> and really to be of service in some way. So whether that forum of service was my own voice, right? Finding my own voice in design and having something unique to say if you're given a platform like the one that I've been able to operate in that I'm grateful to have operated in. Um, and and uh, at the same time, um, trying to kind of find uh, uh, a way to express my identity, right, in some regard, because, I mean, as you know, um, international design, contemporary design, isn't the most uh, diverse place. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's been my uh, great privilege to be the first and only African American to work with all of my clients. And that's kind of crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> you realize that design is somehow this final frontier of culture, you know. For, mm. So for d just to linger on that for a moment, because it feels really important. Sure. What you're saying is that each of the major clients you've had, Roche Bavois, the other companies you've worked with, you were the first African American that they've ever worked with as a designer. That yeah, true? yeah, that's correct. And I suppose you're often the, the first American that they've worked with as a designer as well. Um, yeah, I've also been the first American, yeah. But I guess since 2005, um, I, let's say I started, I did my first pieces for Capellini in 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and that was huge and mind blowing. And I mean, it's hard to explain to the current generation how important that was kind of pre um, internet and pre mobile. <laughs> I'm really dating myself right now. <laughs> I mean, because it gave but, you some uh, visibility and some access or? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it was a question of it being a much, much smaller camp. And so there were only two or three American designers working in Europe for the big companies when I started. Mm. Um, and so um, not only was I American, but uh, Europe very quickly reminded me that I was African American. And, yeah, And so I hadn't really seen myself uh, through uh, that lens, right? I was just there making the things that I believed in. And, and those things were very modernist, right? Um, and, uh, and had a kind of joy and, and their sense of <clears throat> color, et cetera. And were really more about um, uh, legibility. I wanted to, the products, the objects to communicate how they were made. Um, that was always uh, at the forefront of my thinking. And then um, I guess it was really the Missoni patchwork vases, which we're looking at now. Uh, those vases and that project with Missoni uh, kind of made me consider or reconsider the processes of the means of production, right? Mm -hmm. Did I have to work in this kind of 20th century model of the designer as auteur, a kind of signature designer? Um, and in fact, I mean, the, the profession of design has really given us very few examples of, of who you can be in the design world, right? So you can, someone like Raymond Lowy, for example, um, a kind of uh, stylist or, or a corporate tool, right? Um, you can be uh, that, uh, that auteur that we talked about, right? The signature designer. Or you can be a kind of maker artisan, right? They're kind of at the tangent of design, but nobody thinks about that in a cultural sense. And at the time, um, no one was really uh, looking at the rest of the world and, and wondering, you know, why aren't these people, um, the majority world, uh, also participating in what we consider to be contemporary design. There's this revolution happening at the turn of the millennium, right? Um, the digital revolution, of course. And, and, you know, for me, design really needed to kind of open its doors and be less exclusive and more inclusive. Uh, in the same way that it welcomed me in, right? So you're saying more inclusive geographically, more in terms also of the kinds of people that are going to be uh, given a voice in design. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, and culturally, right? So, so they have, um, I like to say that design is a Western concept uh, mm. because it is, right? I mean, we look at the, the, the Western canon, the Industrial Revolution in, the, in Europe and in America, 
um, leading to the Bauhaus, leading to the idea that a designer can be in service of industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of the, the products and the things that the kind of way that we uh, think about design doesn't include um, the majority of the world and, the, and their culture and their cultural perspective. Um, the 2015 Venice Biennale by uh, the late Okrian Wazer was really um, a revelation for me because he titled it All the World's Futures. And so um, for the first time you had uh, a curator and in 2015, you know, it's about time, um, of African descent looking at the entire world, right, as participating in art. And, and the influences and the strides that African Americans had made, right, in the art world. And that made me reflect upon also what we were doing in the design world <clears throat> and the kind of arc that my own practice had taken. So can I ask you a question about stereotyping? Sure. And I guess I want to ask it in two senses. One is whether you were confronted with stereotype, um, stereotypical expectations, either from your clients or press or others. You know, and I, also, well, let me ask the second part of the question too. I'm also wondering when you do begin to work with, let's say artisans from a particular place, how you resist the process of stereotyping that might also be brought to them and how you think of those experiences together. Um, I can say that no matter who you are, uh, what your creative practice is, um, really we all bring our history with us. We all bring our identity with us. We all bring our politics with us. And, uh, and for me, um, since 2005, when I started working in uh, other parts of the world, um, it was really important to me that, that you know, I spoke with my own voice. And uh, it was through um, working with artisans and seeing that kind of immediacy of making that I realized that I could have uh, a different approach, that I could kind of carve out my own path. Mm. Um, and, you know, I hadn't thought of myself as a black designer before. I hadn't thought of myself as African American, but, but, you know, of course I am. And so I have no issue uh, with bringing that with me and, and allowing that to kind of be um, at the forefront of my work in terms of uh, my personality. But like, like anyone coming from a non-European culture that wants to work in design, they're also designers first. Mm. And so uh, I can remember one of the first articles written about me <clears throat> to speak to stereotypes in Europe was uh, uh, described me as tall like a basketballer and elegant like a jazz musician. Mm. So you gotta kind of like, <laughs> if you come from America, right, that's, that's uh, uh, that can be considered politically incorrect. Right. Uh, but then, we also have to imagine that in other places in the world that are less diverse, that have less of a history of coping with um, immigration and, and uh, uh, the, the politics of different kinds of people, um, these more um, homogenous cultures are challenged in that way, right? They don't know how to look at what I bring to the table. So of mm -hmm. course they load it on with all kinds of stereotypes. Um, I was once uh, being interviewed in Germany, <clears throat> I think during the Cologne Fair, and it was around, it was the beginning of, uh, I think it was around 2008, the beginning of Barack Obama's rise to uh, power in the States, and, and, uh, and literally the interviewer um, <laughs> was talking to me, and he looks down and he says, hey, there you are on the cover of this magazine, and on national TV in Germany, he picks up the cover of the magazine, and he says, oh, sorry, that's not you, that's Barack Obama. Wow. And, and I thought, okay, if I have to be compared to anyone, <laughs> I'll take that. But then the funny thing is, he said to me, he's like, you're like the Barack Obama of design. Mm. And, uh, and I said to myself, wow, that's, you know, that's like a backhanded compliment. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how I should take that. Well, it's um, so difficult to disentangle these things, right? Because the combination of well-meaningness and complete caricature that's wrapped up in that or the jazz musician basketball sure. or comment, you know? And I guess you, you just have to navigate each situation and try to find the value in it that you can. Sure, but, but it also forced me to, to, to be 
considerate of the fact that the politics of design are present, that my yeah. politics are present to these people, that, that they see me in relation to a broader diaspora, right? And so that, you know, we have uh, such rich um, historic and cultural traditions to draw from that aren't part of uh, a European context. And, and so it's, it really, moments like that only pushed me further and further um, into the field and, and wanting to, um, you know, make a difference through design. So. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your collaborations with artisans then, of which there have been many and sure. far long as well. So that's a shift that you said you started about 2005, something like that? Yeah, that's right. When I did my first uh, project in South Africa, my first trip to, South, to Africa, to the continent uh, mm -hmm. in 2005. So in 2005, I worked for Aid to Artisans. I started that work with not-for-profits. Um, and... Uh, I was led into that work through a project called Design with Conscience, uh, a company called Art Technica, maybe you're familiar, um, Enrico Brisson, uh, came up to me after the Missoni Patchwork Show and, and, uh, and said, hey, how would you like to work in Africa? Um, we're trying to develop this collection, which takes into consideration other places in the world, other forms of making. And this was a really pivotal moment for me because, you know, I'd never been to the motherland, quote unquote, and, uh, and I was so excited uh, to go and see what that was all about. Um, but then, you know, you arrive and it's like design boot camp. Uh, mm. You're not just the designer, but you're also the export manager and you're also the, the, the business person and you're also the communications director. And, you know, I think I saw something like 12 artisans uh, in a week, um, rotating schedules and, and uh, trying to find ways to um, bring my expertise in design um, uh, and the kind of relationship to industry to their expertise in craft and mm -hmm. production. And South Africa is very interesting because it is a place that has invested greatly in their uh, in maintaining and developing their craft traditions. Um, it's almost a, a kind of touristic uh, pursuit there, right? So they're investing in craft to, to help um, I guess, uh, bring economic transformation to the people that are working, the, the, the black South Africans uh, post-apartheid that are working in, in craft, but then to also offer uh, a kind of identity to the city at large. Um, from then, 2006, I think we worked again in South Africa, I worked in Peru, um, went on to work in Colombia, uh, Mexico, um, India, uh, the Philippines, of course, with Dadon, Indonesia, um, Senegal, Rwanda, Kenya, Ghana. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've been all over the world and all over Europe, of course. Um, and so all of that work uh, has really, um, for me, led to this perspective of, of, of trying to find a way to get the rest of these people involved and engaged in design and, and trying to find broader markets for them. So that's, that's the question that I really want to ask you, maybe the most important question that I can ask uh, in this interview is what philosophy or wisdom have you developed over those long years of collaboration? And, and in particular, I kind of want to ask the question with a little bit of topspin because I feel like there's such an obvious problem that occurs when you're coming in from outside as the designer and sure. you have a certain kind of credential and authority that you carry with you whether you like it or not, as you've been saying. Mm. And I feel like one of the things that is very striking to me about your work is that it, it genuinely feels like it's coming out of a conversation with the artisans in each case. Right. And I wonder how you think about those questions of parity, collaboration, conversation, um, quality, in the uh, quality in the face of inequality or in inequity. Sure. So can you share some of your thoughts about that? Because I'm sure you have had a lot of time to think about it. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, first and foremost, the work is, um, it's, not, it's not a kind of cultural sampling, right? Um, it's, it's not intended to be a, a, a kind of hierarchical, patriarchal, top-down, you do this because I'm, you know, the New York designer kind of situation, right? Um, if anything, what I'm trying to do is kind of invert the pyramid in a sense, and allow um, the people 
with the hands, right? Because we've always believed that everyone's capable of design and hands have power and hands can organize and hands can build economies and, and you know, change culture, right? So it's always been collaborative for me. Um, and it's about uh, accreditation in a sense, right? To say that there's a vocabulary and a language that's spoken in one way um, in a certain place in the world that can be shared um, amongst other places in the world. So I like to um, compare post-war Italy with uh, what's happening around the world in the places that I've worked. Um, and, and most of the companies that we know of in uh, Italian design today were family-owned businesses that were rooted in craft production. And with investment, right, they grew into the major manufacturers that we know of today. So if that can happen in 50, 60 years in Italy, why couldn't it also happen in Senegal? Um, why couldn't it also happen in the Philippines? Why couldn't it also happen in Colombia? Um, and so I think it's just about how we value and perceive uh, craft and, and artisanal production. Mm -hmm. um, it's so interesting that if you, if you think about the, the kind of artisanal practices in Europe and, and how they were in service of royalty initially, right? Um, and I'm speaking about the Baccaras of, of the world, um, how those uh, families and those cultures are um, considered luxury. Uh, but then if you go to another part of the world where they're also working in glass, um, it may have nearly no value. Mm -hmm. So um, our work with artisans and brands and trying to kind of build a bridge from uh, this majority world production to um, what I would consider minority world or mm -hmm. first world distribution, right? Um, that work is about, you know, connecting the two. So trying to kind of shift the perception of uh, craft in these places in association with brands that have value. I think that's a super helpful way of reframing it to realize the majority minority situation as being in fact what it is. And also I love the point that you're making that what looks like a luxury trade in one context can look like a folk craft from another context. That's Absolutely. a really helpful correction. Yeah. What happens when you're actually on the workshop floor with the artisans? Are you able to generally get to a kind of conversation where you don't feel like there's a hierarchy or where you've got that parachute in problem where you're the person with the superior knowledge and you can get that hierarchy of brain over hands to be suspended for the purposes of the conversation? How do you handle that? Um, I've never thought of myself as the person with the superior knowledge, <laughs> even though I'm wearing this Harvard cap. <laughs> this is an intellectual tool, all right? This is helping me. Um, you know, my mom has always told me that I should be able to uh, relate to anyone. Hmm. Um, I, I kind of grew up this way. So it, it, it's the man on the street, the man in the boardroom, the man uh, in the field. Um, they're all people. And we were speaking earlier about this idea of no heroes, uh, because I think it's important to remember that design is a profession. I mean, it's a job like any other job, and, and we don't have to put designers on a pedestal, right? Because they are able to <clears throat> translate material uh, into uh, form with meaning, right? So in those contexts for me, um, I'm there to learn as much as I can as well as share as much as I can. And, and it's, it's different in every place and it's different in every context. Um, I've worked in a lot of different ways. I mean, I've, I've gone as the product development consultant with Eta Artisans, with Artisanista de Colombia, with Design Network Africa, um, with the Clinton Global Initiative after the earthquake in Haiti, for example. Um, I've worked in a lot of different ways. I've tried to be the middleman. Um, you know, Capolini Love, right? I developed those products, the first kind of eco-conscious collection for Capolini uh, back in, I think, 2007, 2008. Um, and I tried to broker that relationship, trying to kind of say, okay, they make it, you sell it. Um, of course, there was a six-time markup and <laughs> some of those products were more than $1,000. Uh, and so not that that can't happen, but we're still looking for the right model. We're still looking for the right way for this to continue. And uh, 
is kind of what the Loeb Fellowship was about for me, um, to take that year at Harvard and think about uh, how the design as a practice can, can make the leap into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actively trying to kind of build a platform uh, where designers in other parts of the world, I'm calling them designers, but artisans, makers, producers in, the, in other parts of the world can have access to a broader um, audience, a broader market for what they make and how everyone could be the designer mm -hmm. and interact directly with those artisans. So this is, this is the kind of final frontier of this work for me. So can you talk a little bit about the other side of that conversation then? You just alluded to it, but the conversation with the brand or the company, because we've been talking about the workshop floor version of the conversation. Right. And how you approach that as this um, to <laughs> totally superiority free zone, right? So yeah. you're all learning from each other. You're including the artisans in the design process and so on. When you actually go back to the company and you start having those conversations about market, and of course you realize that the company is absolutely intrinsic to the success of the operation. Sure. Um, how do you handle that part of it and maximize the potential there? Well, we've tried to be um, <clears throat> experimental there as well. I mean, our current model is to work with brands that uh, have capacity, have artisan relationships, support our way of working. Um, and obviously, Dayton is the best uh, example of that, right? Um, they employ uh, something like 1,500 weavers in peak season and are capable of making 300 pieces of furniture a day mm. impeccably by hand. Uh, and so that relationship allows me to go, um, to be welcomed into the research and development department and, and work directly with master weavers. Uh, Dayton made a choice a long time ago, like 20 something years ago to remain in the Philippines because the Philippines has the highest uh, uh, level of weaving art in Asia. So weaving culture. And uh, obviously it could be cheaper to work in Vietnam, it could be cheaper to work in Indonesia, but they've chosen to stay there. Um, other ways that we've tried to engage industry, if you look at the Traveler Project with Roche Bobois, um, this was very conceptual for their 40th anniversary uh, in America. Um, because we kind of asked the question of, as luxury brands move into new markets, do they have to produce the same thing, right, for, for every market? So you've seen a, a, a rush of uh, European brands kind of making headway in Asia and China mostly, right, over the last 10 years, 15 years. And uh, I guess I question uh, the authenticity of that, right? Is it just another place to sell product or do you really care what this culture thinks or cares about or is interested in? And, and how do those um, relationships in new markets like Asia and soon to be uh, Africa, right? Um, how do those new markets impact the things that you make? Uh, as, as we all begin to discuss sustainability, um, the idea of local production um, can also lead to kind of local cultural influence. I, I believe it should. Mm. So. So you, you do believe that, uh, at least in some cases, that craft or artisanal production can also be a more sustainable option for producing, and I suppose- Absolutely. Objects. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, companies like Exporemim and, and uh, Tanet have been to their factories. Um, they're all working artisanally, right? There's a relationship between the hand and industry that makes this uh, product, mm -hmm. makes those products unique. Um, and you know, there's a long list of companies. There's plenty of artisans. Uh, Roche Bois produces the majority of their furniture in Italy because um, the Italian uh, artisanal community is is um, uh, not only very capable but interested in being experimental. And many of those products are made by hand. Mm. So, yeah. So we talked about um, South Africa and Senegal and the Philippines and Rwanda. Let's talk a little bit about Kentucky. <laughs> so uh, folks will have just seen that label fly by the Berlia <laughs> College crafts. Um, so this is a project that you and I have been working on together for the past, oh, I guess about a year now. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about your experiences of coming into Berlia College, maybe tell a little bit about the history of the place and what we're trying to achieve there. Sure. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Berlia College in Berlia, Kentucky um, was 
the as the oldest integrated uh, college in the South. So I think 1855, um, they had more African American students than uh, sort of non African students, right? African American. Also, uh, they also were accepting women at a time and when very few colleges did that. So exactly. So I mean, it's, yeah. it's a kind of historic place for diversity. Our project is called Crafting Diversity, um, and you know I've been. Um, since the Loeb Fellowship, I've kind of been catapulted into uh, very intensive teaching roles over the past year. So um, I've been teaching at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the Masters of Design Engineering for the past year. And then in a way, Glenn, our project is a kind of teaching uh, project as well, um, but one that we've positioned as more collaborative uh, with the students. So um, I, uh, in terms of the strategy for Berea, um, I'm going in as a, a product development consultant, um, but with a strategy for a number of uh, participatory workshops with the students. So I think we scheduled four um, over the past year. So uh, since last fall, I've been there, um, I think four or five times. And I've spent uh, sometimes less than a week, sometimes uh, a little, almost a week, with the students and with the, the staff there. Um, shout out to Aaron Beal, who's the uh, student craft uh, director. So just to give you a little breakdown of, of how the school works, there's no tuition. Uh, Berea College is tuition free. So all of the students participate in a work study program. And uh, from 1600 students, 100 of those work in craft. Mm. Um, there are four craft sectors, uh, broom craft, um, weaving, uh, woodworking and ceramics and we're developing products across all four of those sectors uh, with the college um, and it's so exciting uh, <laughs> the, the workshops have been really interesting because we're, we're actively you know from the convocation last October um, we made an open call to students to submit ideas uh, come to the workshops um, spend some time with me while I'm there um, talk about uh, what their interest is, uh, not just as the makers, but as a potential creative in the process of making. Yeah. So um, I have to say that although the process wasn't of design wasn't as transparent and inclusive as we would have liked because we didn't get uh, the uptick in, in, in student participation that we were asking for, um, we have designed the products to uh, be kind of open-ended uh, for the students. So. Um, just to speak a little bit about that, the, uh, the ceramics collection, for example, which you may have seen images of, is called Impressions. And uh, it's called Impressions because the students are literally uh, placing their fingerprints and thumbprints and, and <laughs> impressions, their signature, in a sense, into each and every vase, bowl, and tray that they'll be producing in the ceramics studio. Um, there's also a new basket. I think the image just went by. Uh, that I've been developing with woodworking. Um, the basket is, is super interesting because it has a, a kind of modular structure, which is based around um, anodized aluminum links that then are screwed to wooden straps. And, and it's a bit inspired by shaker boxes, um, but the, the, the structure is also um, more open and sort of light, lightweight. Uh, and then in weaving, uh, the weaving collection is beautiful. Actually, I have something that I can show you. You guys want to see? Uh, show and tell. Them, <laughs> have a look at this. So this mm. is one of the pillows from uh, the weaving collection. Um, this is the blanket, which I'm super proud of. This is really beautiful. Um, the whole collection is made with uh, a bamboo. Uh, thread or yarn, um, which has this kind of silky hand and, and very, um, very heavy considering. Uh, it feels so luxurious and, and, and uh, soft. It's amazing. Um, so we're, it's a kind of double weave uh, and the students are weaving, well these are the first samples really, so students will be weaving these in three colorways. And if you look back at my wall you can kind of see the three colorways in a small sample. And then this here on the wall is a, uh, um, a placemat, also part of the collection. So mm -hmm. doing some tabletop. Things. So if I could just pull out a couple of themes out of this um, experience at Berea, 
Sure. One that I think is really interesting is, um, well, the whole question of diversity. And maybe one thing just to explain to the audience if they don't know, is that although Berea had this very inspiring early history, they were forcibly desegregated under the Jim Crow laws at the turn of the 20th century. And then the craft program really was uh, emblematic of a kind of narrow definition of white Appalachian identity for many, many decades. Right. And Aaron Beale, who was mentioned a minute ago, um, has really been instrumental in bringing Stephen in to try to bring in a totally different set of voices and and uh, associations and trajectories into the program. So that's important to say. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, been challenging, huh? I mean, it's been challenging because I, I have to admit, um, I have no idea, uh, well, I had no idea before I went there, um, what white Appalachian, Appalachian culture and craft looked like. Mm. What it looked like, what it felt like, um, what the expectation was. Um, I've, uh, one of the greatest, the kind of highlights of my time down in Berea has been uh, spending time with, uh, with uh, Bell Hooks, um, the, the author, and uh, um, I don't want to call her a feminist writer because she would, she would slap me for that, but. <laughs> she, lives in, she lives in Berea and there's an incredible research center there built around her archive. That's right, the, the Bell Hooks Institute is at Berea College. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, she's really helped me through our conversations, our lunchtime conversations when I'm down there, understand the complexities of race in, in Kentucky and uh, the people there and how we, um, through design, can kind of mend that, right? Bring, bring all these people together. Mm -hmm. um, I think the same goes for uh, sheltering in place, you know, that, that we don't have to look at this as this moment of... Uh, you know, pure disruption, um, that we can also look at it as this moment of creativity and that there's, there's so much potential uh, for things to be um, very different than they were before. I mean, for the first time, we're having conversations about um, income inequality and, you know, COVID inequality, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, yeah. a, it's a really exciting time for, uh, for design to make a difference. Let's get back to that in one second. I just want to ask you one other question about Berea, though, before yeah, we sure. that topic, um, which is just to ask about working with, I don't want to call them a low-skilled population, but let's say a population of student crafters, because right. when you're going into you know, a basket weaving workshop in South Africa, for example, you know that those people are going to be absolutely masterful and they'll have years in their fingers of sure. the intelligence that they're bringing to the task. Sure. Or generations, the actually. Yeah, generations, yeah, yeah. centuries, <clears throat> in many cases. So in Berea, obviously, you have a very different situation, which probably also had a lot to do with the challenges of getting the students actually involved as co-designers, which is that they have a lot going on in their lives, first of all, right? Uh, as full-time students. And also, they actually have a very limited repertoire of skills at their disposal. So I'm wondering how you approach that just in a designerly kind of technical sense. How did you approach that? Well, I mean, I knew that um, the things that we were making would have, would have to have limited complexity. Um, and so I can speak to <clears throat> the, the craft production side and that the students are typically just considered uh, producers, right? Hands in the shop, uh, getting the work done um, to make the products that then go out for sale. Uh, so, so it adds quite another layer of complexity to ask them to also be uh, considerate of the design. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the products, like the basket, uh, this is more an assembly product, right? So it's about the assembly. Uh, that's, that's how the students would mostly be engaged. And, and it doesn't really take uh, much um, experience to, to assemble one of those baskets. Um, once you're trained how to do it, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. And, and it goes back to this idea of legibility in the product. The product explains how it's made, in a sense. But then there's a secondary layer that um, Aaron and I have been talking about, and obviously you're aware of, Glenn, where we'd like the students to go back into the product and think about leaving a mark. Hmm. Um, and those marks, um, as it were, could be as complex as um, an engraving, uh, could be uh, burned into the wood, um, could be signed, right? Um, so, so it's it reminds me about oh, it's funny the uh, 
what is the library in Paris? Uh, is it Henri Le Brust? Yeah. The, the attack the attack national. Yeah. Is it, I thought it's Saint Jean Vieille. No. Mm. Anyway, so that library, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Anyway, yeah, that, that idea that there could be literally the hand of the student on the basket. Um, in the case of the blanket, or sorry, the textile, um, I'm just pulling out one of the placemats here. Um, so in the, uh, in the weft, or sorry, in the warp, there's, there's a single color that can be added across the placemat. And that color can change position and change color. So there the student actually in the production, um, and of course they have to be trained to make these pieces, but in the production, they can also have a contribution creatively. Um, I'm fascinated by that, Stephen, because it, it feels like you're essentially applying principles of mass customization to a very small scale artisanal studio context, which I think is super interesting. Yeah, yeah, this is something that came out of uh, my first product for Dadon, uh, the Dala collection, was the first time we considered this. And we actually have a patent with uh, Dadon for the first outdoor fabric, or first outdoor furniture woven with, uh, uh, woven through expanded aluminum. Mm -hmm. So the pattern that you see on that collection changes with each piece, as the artisan is just asked to weave single stripe, double stripe, and triple stripe in any order they want. Right. So, it's so interesting because mass customization is so often associated with 3D printing and other digital applications. Right. And <laughs> the craft is the original mass customization. That's what absolutely, absolutely. inspiring to, right, is the, the ability to have that flexibility. Um, we just got, uh, have some questions coming in, but I wanted to ask you one last question before we turn to Q&A, Stephen. Sure. It's just about how you're coping and what you're doing right now in the lockdown. So I know you've actually, as you just were saying, have really treated it as a kind of design residency in your own place there. So can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, 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 of course. Um, we're actually working with a curator at the High Museum of Art at the moment. Uh, she's going to actually be on your show. <laughs> <I> Friday, <think>. Monica <laughs> Misty, absolutely. That's yeah. right. Next, uh, is it next week, Lynn? This Friday. This yeah. Friday. Um, and so, uh, around this idea of shelter in place. And, uh, and we've, um, my partner and I, uh, she's an urban planner, um, also from Harvard, and um, we're looking at the things in our domestic setting that, that uh, we're now more closely engaged with, you know, um, because we can't really go out, we can't really socialize, and we, you know, we're spending a lot of time at home and so we're developing uh, a new collection of, of products and objects that are in one sense um, heightening our environment uh, and, and also speaking to um, the idea of this new collection that I'd actually like to put into production, uh, which is around um, uh, kind of, I, for lack of a better description, and I, I don't want to name it to the world right now, but it's, it's, it's about a hand factory, right? Mm -hmm. It's about a, a DIY, um, uh, make it yourself uh, set of ideas. And so um, for each of the objects that we're engaging here in our home around craft, we're also considering, you know, could this be a product that goes into the world and and uh, establishes the concept that everyone's capable of design. You know, can people be more active participants in the products that they choose to live with? And, and can those products, because they're um, asking more of the consumer, right? Can those products find uh, a unique space in the market? So. Great. Yeah, okay. this is sort of the, <laughs> sort of the idea. Well, um, that's a great note to end the uh, conversation on uh, any questions and uh, speaking of participation we do have some so first yeah. I don't know if we have Tim Harry Williams the um, textile artist from Britain here uh, mm -hmm. but he had some questions that he sent in beforehand uh, Tim mm -hmm. you don't happen to be listening in do you yes I'm here I hey don't know. Tim how you doing hey Tim <laughs> good to see you so you sent in some super interesting questions, which we just put in the chat, and it's, it's, it's a little sort of miniature essay in its own right. But, um, yeah, what what are your uh, thoughts having now heard Stephen talking about his work? Uh, 
Oops, sorry, we can't hear you. Got to unmute you, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I and in before I'd heard uh, the conversation, uh, but I thought I should try and put something in. Um, yeah, the first the first question I think st uh, stands because obviously uh, Stephen's model is very much based in this um, international network of highly skilled artisans that are able to uh, you know um, produce through this um, very embodied um, you know tacit skill base etc. Um, and it's essentially um, a way of not essentially, it's a way of producing wonderful things, um, but f from another place. And, and I, I am very con we're all very conscious now in the current pandemic culture that the world is already bigger and potentially getting bigger. And how, how does that balance in, in you know, long term, this um, being able to reach out to these artisans now that that potentially could be a very different um, it could be a very different market. <laughs> so mm. that that part of my question still stands. And then there were some other bits of question too about Let's tackle that first. So, so what's the what's the effect of the pandemic on the whole? Yeah, model? because I, you know we yeah. things are going to be different. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think different is good, Tim. Um, I'm I get really scared uh, when people say they want things to be the same. <laughs> I think uh, the, the, we keep talking about the majority world, the majority world of people out there, including the artisans I work with, including some people in the minority world are really anxious for change, right? Um, I think the people that want things to be the same are the ones that um, were very comfortable before. Um, and, and a lot of us uh, weren't so comfortable with the status quo. So we're looking for things to be different. Um, the way those things will be different and as it applies to my practice um, is a little challenging. Yeah, I mean, I may not be able to make these trips uh, in person. And so this is part of what I was talking about before, this idea of the hand factory. Mm. Like, can we, um, and we're working on this, I'm, I'm hoping we can, I'm hoping we can make a platform that will allow the artisans to engage not just with us, but with just about anybody um, mm. anywhere in the world and, and make a thing. Um, mm. And then the other side of the coin, right, that we're also considering is, can we also make products that um, people make themselves? So we're trying to kind of approach it from both directions. But, you know, the pandemic has made us reconsider, and I think in a very exciting way, not just, you know, the, the, the rampant cycle of, you know, this annual massive Milan Furniture Fair production, um, but then also how we design our homes, how we design our cities, um, how we design the subway. I mean, everything is being uh, rethought. Uh, and I think it's these moments of uh, a kind of global awareness, right? When we look at um, something that impacts us all, and I'm thinking about you know 1918 pandemic, I'm thinking about the world wars. Um, it's these moments afterwards where you know, the world is reinvented. Uh, for the better and hopefully we're all coming together um, instead of being pulled apart. Yeah. Great. Um, Tim, I know you had some other questions, but I'm just going to move us along because we yeah. have a few others. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's great to see you. Uh, Tiziana Boldenebro, are you with us? Hi. Hey. <laughs> Thank you both so much for your talk. It was really wonderful. Um, so I just had a quick question about um, approaches to eco-consciousness or green design. Um, I really love this idea that you sort of mentioned about design being a uh, Western sort of centric um, mindset. And so, you know, as we start to think about eco or green design, um, how have your approaches to that form or to those ideas changed or shifted based on your encounters with disparate global perspectives? Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is that these other parts of the world, they don't have the luxury of considering what's green and what isn't, right? Um, the, the, our position on that, um, not just being the minority, but being the majority polluters of the world, um, is from a place of luxury, right? We can choose to recycle. We can choose uh, what we're purchasing. <laughs> we can choose to have Amazon bring everything to our door or not, right? Uh, but in other places in the world, you know, you'll see people pollute and it's just, 
it's crazy. It's kind of heart wrenching because the, 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 it's so beautiful the places that I've been, and 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 they're you know they're not necessarily thinking about it in those terms yet. And and so I think we have to keep in mind that there are these kind of parallel tracks that uh, I mentioned uh, um, all the world's futures before, um, because that also reframed the way, um, you know, I thought about how cultures progress in the world, um, that we can be uh, here and they can be there and one is neither better than the other. That, that all of these points of view around uh, sustainability or not right, can exist in the world at the same time. Um, and uh, the idea of progress is one that I think should be uh, available to everyone, um, but no one culture has the right to dictate uh, how others deal with that. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. <laughs> but, but. That idea of uh, you know, embracing a kind of cultural relativism without abandoning the concept of progress, that does seem mm -hmm. like an incredibly good way of formulating the problem, obviously a hard problem to solve, but it's, it's like a fantastic way of just modeling what the problem is. Um, Okay, let's uh, move on to another question. Thank Thanks, you, so Tatiana. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to a question from Leora Honeyman. Hi. Hey, Leora. Hi. Hi. Hi, great talk. Really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Glenn, for putting these on. Uh, yeah, so um, you, you've, your work has this really dynamic quality where you are clearly engaging on a very level in a very level way with the, the artisans you're working with, which is quite unusual, I think. And I'm wondering how, um, how you nurture their voice as well as makers um, and slightly separately, how you avoid becoming just another um, art tourist. Right, right. Um, well, I mean, I'm always working, so I'm not a tourist. <laughs> but but it it's you know it's tough because um it's not a permanent condition for me right these trips are, are moments in time where i'm kind of hopping here hopping there hopping here but for the artisans that are uh, quote unquote left behind or remain in that place the work has to go on um and and i have to say what was very disheartening to me early in my career um was the work with non -for not for profits because they had funding for only a limited amount of time, and and so I go and make this investment and these promises and these claims, et cetera, et cetera, and then all of a sudden the whole project just gets cut because the funding dries up, and and so in one way, um, I've tried to maintain these connections independently. Uh, but it's it's been really it's been really difficult over the years. It's been really difficult to uh, to find um, the, the the means uh, to find the, the the project to find the the arc where I can continue to engage and and help um, or at least offer guidance in how the artisans that I'm working with grow. Uh, and so I. You know, it's 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 really brought to our attention that we have to have more opportunities for them, uh, and more opportunities for these ways of working, which has led me to the concept that we're developing now. Um, I don't really there's no easy answer uh, to what your what your question is. This idea of of you know uh, craft tourism or design tourism. I mean, this is this is part of the culture as well. Um, but I think the places that the countries that uh, have kind of governmental organizations that also invest um, manage this quite well. Uh, and obviously it's not America, <laughs> but other places in the world, I think like Colombia with Artis Nias to Colombia and uh, the Cape Craft Design Institute in South Africa, um, these places are, are um, platforms in themselves for artisan um, growth and production. Mm. Thank you very much, Leora, for that question. And we're going to just take one more from Sarah Pringle. Is Sarah Pringle calling from the UK? Hey, Sarah. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hi, Hi. thanks for calling in. Hey, Sarah. 
Um, I'm not from the UK. I'm from Massachusetts. All right. <laughs> New England. <laughs> New England. <laughs> Welcome. So I'm an applied artist and I'm, um, I'm in my sixth decade and have been working at it uh, probably 40 years now. And I'm always interested in people's experience in, so you have so much experience traveling the world and with your design aesthetic and the development of your creative work. What do you perceive as what the system of making a living mm -hmm. as an artisan? Is that something that you see as expanding globally? Yeah, and you just touched on it, actually, what you just spoke about in the previous caller's um, comment. Well, I mean, it, it is a tough time. I mean, it's a tough time for the whole industry, right? Um, you know, there's so many companies in Italy and clients of mine that I'm working with that are really challenged at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I know for a lot of us, uh, furniture sales are not top of mind. <laughs> We're not all just running out and, <laughs> you know, buying a $10,000 sofa today. Um, but I, I can say that we also live in the most pluralistic time in history, you know, um, if there was ever a better moment to kind of speak with your own voice and find your own audience, it has to be now. Um, we have the capacity to reach everyone in the world. Like, I mean, the few people I'm reaching now um, and the, the people that you're reaching now, um, I love that patterned uh, board over your right shoulder at the top. Yeah, that's, that's really beautiful. Is that your work? It is. Ah, cool, cool. Yeah, so I, I just think that there, we just have to be more creative in, in the ways that we try to find an audience for what we do and, and more open. Um, for me, one project has always led to another, which is, you know, that stream of consciousness thing. You know, maybe a chair somehow leads to a fragrance package, somehow leads to an interior, you know. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I think for me, it's more wanting to, um, let's see, you spoke, you know, have more opportunities for artisans. And it's not so much about me as much as, um, trying to figure out, how, it just seems that your process is a collaborative process that is, how it integrates is by the use of handwork in some of the cases. Mm -hmm. And that it works, that you're working at this level of production and right. right, times are certainly difficult right now, but in the bigger picture, how do we keep this handwork moving forward? How do we pass it down? Yeah, I mean, extending these craft traditions into the future is definitely our goal. Um, I, I think it has to do a lot with how we frame design and how we consider luxury and how we consider, you know, what the hand brings. I mean, typically in industrial production, the more uh, you interfere with that industrial process, um, the, the, the more... Uh, the product becomes more expensive and right, right? And, and and you kind of lose value right in a sense um but we believe the more the hand interferes with that process the more value we can bring to it um and we we look at those artisanal experiences with industry as opportunities for innovation uh, and and i think that 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 just keeps us going you know um and, and as I consider the bigger picture of, of not just my work, but, you know, everyone out there that's working in similar ways, um, you know, what can we do? Uh, what can we do besides, um, you know, looking at ourselves and talking constantly about ourselves? What can we do for, for other people? Design has to also be, in ser be of service. Um, and not just in service of industry, but also in service of people, right? So. It's kind of about a dialogue, both with the market and with uh, distribution. That's a fantastic uh, answer and great place to end. I'm really beautiful to find some optimism in the present circumstances too. So thank you for that, Stephen. Yeah, it's thanks for the conversation. I don't uh, want to end. This is great. This is really great. <laughs> <laughs> me either. Uh, we have rules here, design dialogue. But um, let me just uh, say quickly that we have 
some uh, great sessions coming up on Wednesday and Friday this week. We have uh, Jeannie greenberg Rohayton from Salon 94 on Wednesday. And then we have a triple act on Friday, including Monica Obniski, who Stephen mentioned. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about shelter in place with him. And also Darren Alfred from the Denver Art Museum and Bobby Tigerman from LACMA. And they're gonna be talking about a couple of curatorial collaborations that they've undertaken. So come on back for that. And uh, Stephen, this has been fantastic. Really, really appreciate your time and all your insights. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, giving us a reason to uh, look to tomorrow with some uh, hope. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate so, it. Okay, thanks Thank everybody, everybody for tuning in.